I think in many ways the best thing for the university to do with its faculty members is to leave them alone. And I mean that in the best possible way. I mean, that was actually one of the things I, I taught here from 93 to 98. And one of the things, and, and I have the same relationship, I would say, with the university as the University of Toronto, is that the universities go to a tremendous amount of trouble to identify promising people in, in terms of their research capability from all over the world. And generally speaking, if you identify promising people, your best bet as a manager is to stay out of their way. Now, and to remove obstacles from their, from, their, from their movement forward. And I think that the universities do a credible job of that, although my sense uh, over the last few decades has been that increasingly there are more impediments placed in the path of, of research, for example. I've seen that with the multiplication of the powers of, of institutional review boards, for example, ethics committees, which have vastly overreached their, 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 their reasonable powers and they slow things down and that's a big mistake if you're dealing with people who are, are conducting research into important topics then you want to do everything you possibly can to let them move forward as rapidly as possible. In what ways do you think these institutional review boards or these ethics committees have particularly damaged the process or the speed of research? research? Do you think there are times, like do you have any examples in mind of when you think they've overreached their power? Well, they, re they regulate Oh, okay. Yeah, you gotta ask. That one's not on? <laughs> okay. Well, let's, let's find it here. Is that better? <laughs> okay. <laughs> now you can hear me, which at least in principle should be an improvement. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, oh yes, that's much better. <laughs> yeah. Well, in, in the social sciences, for example, the, the institutional review boards insist upon reviewing the use of questionnaires in research, which I think is, is it's, it's not helpful. Hmm. Questionnaires aren't dangerous, and they have no real policies set in place to determine the difference between dangerous research and the normal dangers that people expose themselves on, to on a daily basis. Hmm. So, um, and they've certainly, the institutional review boards have certainly slowed down the work in my lab, for example, and made it much more onerous. We have to do a tremendous amount of writing and justification for the studies long before they're even undertaken and then also to do a fair bit of paperwork to keep up with the documentation and I don't find that the least bit useful and I know that in the United States the institutional review board's domains of power are being cut back now because of complaints primarily if I remember correctly primarily from the, primarily from the granting agencies because they're adding to the, the unnecessary expense that's associated with research so in the university should the, the university administration fundamentally exists to serve the faculty and the students, and probably the students first and the faculty second. But increasingly, I see that the administration is, is multiplying out of control, and, and th that's quite well documented in terms of overall cost. And some of that's driven by legislation, and it, so it, it's, not, it's not something that's necessarily intrinsic to the administration itself. But that's one of the things that's driving the spiraling up ever ever upward spiraling of tuition costs. Yep. So aside from research ethics boards, institutional review boards, ethics committees, do you think that there are other ways that the administration has interfered with your work? Particularly, you've recently come under fire by some administration at the University of Toronto for certain controversial views you hold. You mentioned that you think the administration's primary obligation should be to its students, and then it should also serve its faculty. Do you see the administration using that mission properly when they try to talk to faculty about certain statements that they've made, or do you think that's also an overreach of their power? Well, I think it reflects a more general societal confusion about just exactly what our priorities are. I made a video back in September stating my objections to the mandated use of a certain category of pronoun that I object to, mostly on the grounds that I felt that the government had no right compelling people's speech, and also because personally I didn't want to use the pronouns that were being put forward by people I regard as holding a philosophical and political ethos that I find 
really, really quite detestable. Mm -hmm. And I made a video about that and mentioned during the video that the act of making the video had probably become, had arguably become illegal in Ontario, in the province I'm from, and was about to become illegal federally with some new legislation, and that it likely violated the the code of conduct that, that, that characterized the university with regards to its in inclusiveness policies. And the university promptly validated my concerns by sending me two letters telling me to stop making such statements because they violated the university's code of conduct and also the relevant human rights legislation in Ontario and, and in the federal government. And one of the, th th I, I felt that the reason that the university did that was because they had faced a certain amount of public pressure from people at the University of Toronto and that would be mostly, most of that pressure came from people I would regard as the professional activist types mm -hmm. and the university uh, said that they had received many letters accusing me of making the University of Toronto an unsafe space which is the sort of language that immediately makes you know that you're dealing with people who are ideologically possessed. Mm -hmm. But they also, but they failed to note at the same time that they had received hundreds, perhaps thousands of letters, as well as a 10,000 signature petition supporting my stance. Hmm. And so I think when the administration, uh, when, when the administration regards its duty, its fundamental duty to promote some illusory notion of safety, and then also is willing to falsify the facts on the ground by, by omission, that they have definitely overstepped their boundaries. And I would say that. Uh, they were they were put back they were set back on their heels let's put it that way by a, a very uh, strident outpouring strident powerful outpouring of public opinion in Canada and that was all the that was good for me because I got two letters and generally if you're dealing with human resources professionals then three letters is the warning and then the, the next step is something more serious I'm curious, you mentioned the term safe space in particular for a university, and I want you to link this back to this idea that university administration should be serving students first and faculty second. So do you think that the administration has some sort of compelling mandate to make sure that students feel safe? No, they have, a, they have exactly the reverse mandate. There's nothing safe about being educated. If you want to be safe, stay home. The things that you need to be educated about are terrible things, almost always. If you study history properly, it's terrible. If you study literature properly, it's terrible. If you study psychology properly, all of these fields of endeavor teach you the painful things that you need to know to understand what human beings and society are like. And so the idea, first of all, the idea that university should be a safe space is absolutely preposterous, but it's also preposterous for more, more, I would say, immediate reasons. So one of the, one of the, there's a few things that we know as as clinical psychologists, say, uh, as, as a field and also as practitioners with regards to how to treat people who suffer, let's say, from an excess of anxiety. Mm -hmm. And what you do with people who suffer from an excess of anxiety is expose them to the very things that they're afraid of or sometimes disgusted by. And you, ha you help them voluntarily expose themselves to such things. And that doesn't make the world safer, it makes them braver and more competent. And so the, the notion that you serve students uh, safety concerns even by shielding them from things that they don't wish to encounter. There's, there's absolutely, I, I can't think of a single possible uh, valid reason why you would ever undertake such an endeavor. I think it's really neat to talk about it in the abstract, but the particular concern that perhaps a lot of students and a lot of members of the community have with your case is the particular pronoun usage issue. So in that instance, I'm wondering if you think there's a real harm so if someone comes to you, one of your students, let's say, and would really feel more comfortable engaging with the deep, troubling, historical or psychological or whatever field truths, if you refer to the student with certain pronouns, do you really think that's a necessary place where they need that, you know, severe exposure? Or do you think there is some sort of, you know, harm by calling them the pronoun that well, I, I think it's, I think it's fundamentally a fabricated issue. It's been fabricated mm -hmm. for political reasons. I know the history of the relevant legislation in Ontario. Initially, the legislation was basically predicated on the idea that, that gender identity was a social construct and that there, there were going to be protections put in place for people whose gender identity had switched so that they weren't subject to harassment or, or discrimination. I mean, there's no utility in subjecting people to counterproductive discrimination. I would consider discrimination counterproductive mm -hmm. when the discrimination occurs for reasons that aren't relevant to the task at hand. Sure. Because we discriminate all the time. 
but the, the, the government ran the policies by a relatively select group of, of activists and, and transformed it into a, a piece of policy legislation that no one in their right mind would abide by, or could abide by for that matter and reduced, for example, the idea of human identity to something that basically transforms on a subjective whim. Mm -hmm. And so I don't buy any of that. I don't, I don't think that that's what identity is. I don't think it's fundamentally self-generated. It, it might be socio-culturally constructed to some degree, and it most certainly is. Mm -hmm. But the idea that um, your identity is solely your choice and that you have the, the right to inflict that on other people is absolutely preposterous. Most people grow out of that idea when they're two years of age. And, and I mean that technically, because we know that when children hit about three years of age, they're able to start playing social games, and that's when they start learning that that identity is, a, is at minimum a socially no negotiated phenomenon. Now, 